Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Nano at Tech seminar series. My name is David Godfrey, um, and I am the organizer of this series. Um, as you probably know, if you're a, a longtime attendee at this seminar, this is our first opportunity to uh, operate in a virtual mode. Um, back in March, when COVID-19 first struck, of course, we had a, a number of uh, speakers lined up, and we had to rapidly cancel. And so actually today's speaker was, I think, the next person on our list back in March. So we're happy that he's able to join us again. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about Nanotech, uh, we are a bi-monthly seminar series, the second and fourth Tuesday of the month uh, during the academic calendar year. Um, and um, normally, of course, we would be in person in the Marcus Building on the Georgia Tech campus um, with pizza. Um, and unfortunately, there is no virtual pizza today. Um, this program is sponsored uh, by the Southeastern Nanotechnology Infrastructure Corridor, which is a member site of the National Nanotechnology in, uh, Coordinated Infrastructure. Um, and I'm actually happy to announce that the NNCI program officially was renewed for another five years as of yesterday. So, uh, so hopefully we'll be doing this for at least the next five years. The, today's seminar is actually also co-sponsored by the Microphysiological System Seminar Series, uh, another seminar series here at Georgia Tech. And so I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, uh, David Mertz, uh, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you, David. I hope you all can see my slide. Uh, this is just an overview of this student-organized seminar series that we have been able to Put together and it got started uh, this past summer in 2019 and what we have been doing is these once a month talks featuring a mix of invited speakers uh, along with students and professors on campus and we've been doing that up until uh, COVID in March and so you can see here a list of some of the speakers we've been fortunate enough to host uh, during the previous year um, Pil Yu Kang from George Mason, Han Sung Cho from UNC Charlotte, uh, our own Sung Jin Park from Emory University, Annalise Barron from Stanford, and Lei Dong Mao from UGA. And then uh, here are several pictures of all the uh, grad students who have been involved with the organization, and uh, definitely Shuichi Takayama, uh, BME professor, who is also our advisor. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. or Professor David Myers is currently an assistant professor in the Wallace H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech and Emory University. And David's varied interests have fueled an unusual educational background that fuses engineering, microsystem design, biology, and clinical research. Working at the intersection of these fields, he has authored and contributed to publications in Nature Materials, Nature Communications, Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences, and Blood, and is the recipient of the NIH R21 Trailblazer Award, as well as the NIH K25 Award. So please join me all in welcoming Professor David Myers. All right, well, David and David, thanks very much. Uh, great to see you both. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you about is kind of my own personal journey uh, from a very traditional MEMS background into medicine um, and kind of highlight some of the opportunities that I think uh, might be available moving forward. Um, so what's unusual about me is I actually remember the exact moment that I wanted to go to graduate school. And it was when I saw this picture in a undergraduate electrical engineering class. Uh, so this is, most of your eyes may be drawn to the giant mite, which is you know less than a thousand microns, but I was really interested in this uh, amazing gear train. Let me get my pointer out. And I thought, wow, I've got to know how to do that. And you can do a lot of things with gear trains that move. You can make a bug carousel, as you can see here. And you can also just, you know, make them move. And so this technology has just always been fascinating to me, small and mechanical in nature. And what's amazing is, is uh, you can actually still see these images today at Sandia's, uh, Sandia National Laboratory's website. 
Uh, and all of this technology is part of this kind of broad concept of MEMS, microelectrical mechanical systems. Now, you may or may not be aware of MEMS in your everyday life, but they've been quietly changing the world and how we interact with it. So I actually started grad school before the iPhone. I know it's a shocker. But if you think about the iPhone in of itself, it's really the way we interact with it and how we interact with it is, is enabled to a large extent by sensors and microsensors. And sensors have really been changing the world beyond just iPhones and the switch platform. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the number of sensors in an iPhone, it's over 60. And these include microphones, um, inertial measurement units, such as an accelerometer and a gyroscope. You have pressure sensors, moisture sensors. You have over 60 RF filters. It's got a touch responsive screen. And if you think about it, these are the things that make the iPhone great to interact with. But beyond that, MEMS have also been changing our world around us. Now we have autonomous vehicles, autonomous air vehicles. And you know, eventually I can even get my groceries delivered. I think this was a pilot by Kroger to have a car that just brings you your um, groceries for the week. And the question is why? What, what, what is it about MEMS that make them so powerful? And the answer is uh, they're lightweight, they're small, they're low power, and they're sensitive. And I know you may be looking at this list and thinking to yourself, eh, that seems pretty exhaustive. And what's surprising is for my PhD, I actually focused on what was missing. So if you're looking at this list and you're saying, eh, I don't know if there's anything missing, David, there was something small uh, that was still pretty impactful for us. And that was you couldn't measure force on small scales. Now, if you can measure force on small scales, you can start turning any object into a force sensor. In this particular case, this is a bearing, something that you might see on a train car. And then what we can do is with this small uh, micro force sensor, it can actually detect the force of each one of the races going past the bearing. So you can actually get a really accurate measurement of your bearing health and replace bearings as needed not just uh, on a schedule. So if we zoom in on this package, then we zoom in again, uh, this was the heart of our sensing technology and it's a double-ended tuning fork. Now what's neat about double-ended tuning forks is how they work. In effect, they're like a rubber band. So <clears throat> just like a rubber band, if you were, uh, or a guitar string, the tension changes the frequency, right? So if we go ding, 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 you can hear this change in the pitch, and you can actually take advantage of this phenomenon, which is frequency changes with tension, and you can build effectively small semiconductor rubber bands, and that's what we have here, so this is your rubber band. And you can drive them with these comb drives, which you can see here, here's a video of one working, and as these comb drives move and actuate this structure at a certain resonant frequency, you can measure the strain. Now, what's amazing is these gauges are a thousand times more sensitive than standard strain gauges. They can measure nano strain. Just to put that in perspective, if you have a sensor package like this on the end of a diving board, nano strain is the amount of force that an ant places as it walks across your diving board on the other side. So these are very sensitive. They're very versatile and they can actually be made from a number of different materials. And in particular, one of the materials I focused on for graduate school is something called silicon carbide. Now, silicon carbide turns this ordinary string gauge into something that can survive 100,000 Gs, 600 degrees uh, Celsius, and uh, pretty nasty environments, even acid. And the question is, why? Why would someone want a string gauge that survives that extreme environment? Now, it was a DARPA project. And they didn't tell us what it was for, but you know, being an educated person, you can make a guess that perhaps it was for ballistics, especially when they asked us for proof that our gauge could survive 64,000 Gs. And that's what you see down here. Um, this is our gauge is in, in this little housing and it's literally being shot out of this cannon um, and then caught on a pillow, but we hit 64,000 Gs. Now I loved my PhD, it was a lot of fun and I published in um, a lot of great MEMS journals, um, did a lot of fun things like shooting string gauges out of cannons. But 
I didn't want to spend my life working on um, military projects and, and necessarily uh, continuing to go just with these kind of uh, technological areas. So the question is, what else can we do? Where can I go from here building on this? And my journey took me to looking at clinical sensors. And if we look at clinical sensors, the majority of these sensors are not lightweight, they're not small, and they're not low power. Um, so here you can see these are non-invasive to look at hemodynamics. Uh, we have some cardio stuff. There is cardio MEMS, really cool, nice and fairly small package. Glucose wearable sensors, sweats really come into vogue. There's motion sensors and heart rate monitors, but none of these are really comfortable and small. And the other thing is keeping in mind that the blood pressure cuff was invented in the 1800s, where are the mechanical sensors? There's got to be more. We know blood pressure is important and that it's mechanical. So are there other mechanics that matter that we could measure? And so I happened to run into this absolutely amazing um, engineer and hematologist, uh, Wilbur Lamb, who many of you are familiar with. And Wilbur and I started working together and seeing if, if we could bring sensors to uh, living systems and, and biology and hematology. So Wilbur really taught me a lot about hematology, and I thought I would just give you all a little bit of background today. Um, so the, the primary idea is that cardiovascular system uh, and the circulatory system could benefit from mechanical sensors. So if we look at a blood vessel, a blood vessel is um, lined with endothelial cells that you see in orange, and it's got white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. And during an injury event, you get this rupture and immediately blood starts flowing out of your wound and you have this exposed collagen. The exposed collagen starts activating platelets, which stick to the wound. And eventually they set up a thrombin gradient and there's this polymeric material called fibrin that forms and you get this big old clot. Now, one thing that's fascinating about clotting is that it, you need a plug, but the other thing that happens during clotting is that this plug actually contracts pretty small. And if we take platelets and fibrin uh, and throw them in a tube and watch this process, you can actually see that platelets plus fibrin, fibrinogen plus thrombin put in this tube in about 25 minutes go uh, become smaller by an order of magnitude and actually become stiffer by an order of magnitude. And this dramatic change in the clot size is mediated by little tiny platelets pulling on this fibrin mesh. So this is a zoom in of uh, what this would look like. Now you may be wondering like, yeah, cool, mechanics, blood, does it matter? And the answer is it, it does. We know that the mechanical properties of blood clots are linked to disease. Um, so in uh, post-myocardial infarction, so that was you had some sort of clotting event that led to a heart attack, your clots are 50% stiffer and more resistant to dissolution. In patients with bleeding disorders, their clots can be seven times softer than a, a standard clot. And the question is, if we can understand why the mechanics are changing, maybe we can understand the links between blood clot mechanics and pathology. Now, when we look at a mechanic, at a blood clot, sorry, let me go back a little bit. You can see it's a pretty complex structure. You have this fibrin in blue, you have these platelet clumps, purple, and you have entrapped cells occasionally, red blood cells in this case. Now, from a scientific and mechanics perspective, we know a lot about fibrin. In particular, we know it's a nonlinear material that's capable of unfolding. So here's your standard force strain curve for uh, fibrin. We also know that its structure changes depending on the microenvironment. So if you uh, apply flow to fibrin, it actually will align, become anisotropic. And we also know that the structure, the size of the fibrin can change uh, on different uh, sorry, the, the thickness of the fibers and the density can change as well. But what's important to realize is that fibrin is pretty well characterized. Although this is complicated, we can still model fibrin and understand it. What we don't know a lot about is platelets themselves. You can imagine that as you undergo this contraction process, the platelets play a huge role 
in defining clot mechanics, but we really don't know a lot about them. Now, Wilbur, when he was a postdoc, started to really focus on answering this question using atomic force microscopy. And what he was able to show was that single platelets, uh, the amount of force that a single platelet applies depends on its microenvironment. If it's in a really soft microenvironment here, it doesn't apply a lot of force. And as the microenvironment becomes more and more stiff, it applies more force. But what you can see is that the platelet itself is pretty variable. Um, you can have a, a big change in response. And the other thing I'd like to point out is that I'm sure there are a lot of graduate students on the call. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And I'm sure that you've had these times where your advisor has given you a project that seems ridiculous and time consuming. Uh, and in this particular case, Wilbur was telling me that when he decided to start working on this project, he measured about one single platelet every three days uh, because it was so fraught with failure and opportunities for the experiment to go wrong. So this single graph took about three months to collect. Um, but in the end, it was worth it. He got an amazing publication in Nature Materials, so it was, it was well worth the time. So what my task was is to see if I could improve the collection time. So instead of taking three months to get a single graph, could we use microsystems to uh, get a much faster measurement? And so since I have a microsystems and nanosystems crowd, I hope you will uh, indulge me for a minute while I geek out because it's not often that I get to talk about these things. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, measurement techniques that have been developed over the years that are specific, specifically focused on measuring the forces of cells. And the question is, do they work for platelets? Now, one of the most common uh, that was pioneered by Chris Chen many years ago is a micropost array. And basically it's, it's a bed of nails. So this is PDMS or some other soft material, but typically PDMS. What happens is, is that you pattern the top with a protein or a ligand that the cell can stick to. The cell spreads out to these different pillars and it applies a force to the pillar. But there's some problems with this. The first is, is that the stiffness area is tied to the interaction. I'm sorry, <clears throat> tied to the interaction size. So if I want this to be a soft post, I need this to be pretty narrow. And if this is a really stiff post, it gets pretty wide. So it, it actually, remember, platelets, the amount of force that they apply depends on their microenvironment. And so I have a little bit of a problem here that I can't really test how platelets apply force to the microenvironment um, independent of changing the size of these posts, which could also change the platelets. But the other big problem with these is that for them to work with platelets, I need nano-sized pillars. Uh, so what am I gonna do? Measure these with a scanning electron microscope? I, I don't think so. So this is just never gonna work. Um, the second uh, technique that's often used is something called traction force microscopy. And this is when you embed a bunch of beads inside of a gel, you put cells on top of the surface and you watch the beads displace. Um, and you can imagine that trying to extract forces from few bead displacements and some fiduciary markers uh, is, is really not through high throughput and it requires a lot of computational work. And, in, and indeed, when you see papers that use this technique for platelets, they tend to measure you know, 20 to 30, maybe 50 platelets total for the whole paper. So that's not gonna work for what I need. Um, and then the final one was, it, it's, it's to talk to the MEMS people in the crowd. So uh, coming from that strain sensor background, I was so proud of this idea. Uh, I built a micromechanical flexure, basically a big spring. Yeah, this is gonna work. This is the way to test platelets. And what was really sad is that Despite all of those efforts, uh, it was doomed for failure at the very beginning. And the thing that I forgot is that platelets land everywhere and they don't land where you expect them to. So, uh, you know, that was six months down the drain, but uh, you know, right about the time that you hit a low point in your research and you're not really sure where to go next, uh, sometimes uh, you, you get inspiration from friends. And so what happened was I happened to be talking to Tom Barker, who was um, at Georgia Tech at the, at the time, and he said, you know, David, I've got this friend named Michael Smith at Boston. You should really check out his technique. 
And I did. And uh, Michael Smith and Sam Polio had developed this really cool um, uh, modification of traction force microscopy where they micro pattern protein islands on top of a gel. And what's the beauty of this system is that each one of these protein dots, the amount of force that's applied to it is linearly proportional to the displacement and also proportional to some material properties. So I, this was a winning formula. It was scalable to platelets and easily tune it um, by changing the stiffness of the gel independent of the size of this protein dot. Uh, and it made for really simple force analysis. Now, the one thing I had to answer before designing these dots was how far apart should the dots be? Um, is there an optimum? And one thing that was nice is that we can look back uh, in the literature and, and uh, sometimes there are these really cool papers that tell you more than they originally intended. And in this case, uh, Ashley Keita, who was uh, working with Wilbur, uh, just took platelets and put them on different size proteins and left gaps. And what we found was that uh, the fraction of span, so how often platelets could span these, these gaps, was dependent on the distance between them. Makes sense, but more importantly, if I have a gap of about two microns, about 40% of platelets can span that gap. And that seemed like a nice optimal uh, design distance to aim for. Most of my plate, a fair number of platelets could span that gap. And so this is how far platelets reach. So I built this first prototype system. And what you can see is that platelets are actually dropping from the top and they're landing on these dots. And if we can zoom in and look together right here, I know that it is difficult to see the movement of these three dots, but uh, if you trust me, they are moving together a bit. You can see here's the actual platelet pulling these dots together. And this was my first success. We can actually see that platelets are landing on these dots and pulling them together and applying force. But no, as with all first systems, there were some issues. Uh, first, the platelets are landing on multiple dots. That makes the math a little bit harder. It's not simple. There's a long drop time to the surface. Uh, so it was taking, in this particular case, sometimes an hour or two for the platelets to get down to the surface. Um, and there was concern among the biological community that maybe the platelets are exhausted by the time they get down to the surface. Um, we wanted to do some experiments with shear stress, and we couldn't control shear stress in this system because it was a big static well. Uh, and we needed even higher throughput than, than I could get with this. And so finally, what I came up with was this scalable system uh, where we just micro patterned the dots on the hydrogel, but we just did pairs of dots, so two at a time. And the system worked quite well. A uh, platelet would land on a micro dot, would spread to its neighbor, would apply force, and the micro dot displacement was directly proportional to the force that a platelet applied. So here you can see these are two micro dots. Uh, this was their starting distance. This was a platelet that's moderately contractile, and this is a highly contractile platelet. You can see that the amount of displacement increases with the amount of force. We could watch these in real time and watch how a platelet develops force. We also knew that a platelet took about eh, 30 to 60 minutes to uh, fully contract. Now I can go even higher throughput by taking this scalable system of dots, and instead of just having large single wells, I was able to put these inside of a microfluidic device by casting. So we would take this patterned protein, lay it on top of the device, and inject gel down in here. And then the gel would actually covalently attach to the protein. And when you rip off this lid, you have this patterned, these patterned sets of gels. You could put a microfluidic on top. The nice thing is, is that I can start to measure uh, how a platelet responds to different stiffnesses and how a platelet responds to uh, different concentrations of agonists, things that activate the platelets and turn them on uh, and cause them to begin contracting. Uh, so, uh, you know, this may not look like a traditional microsystem, but for the, the MEMS and, and micro nano people in the audience, uh, when you look at my process flow, it, it basically looks like any other process flow that you would see in JMEMS um, or uh, small and some of the other microsystems journal. It's basic, it's a modification and you build stuff layer by layer and you come up with some pretty cool devices. So I have this cool device. Uh, I have a reliable system that I can measure a lot of platelets. And what I started to do was to measure 
um, how platelets respond in a variety of different uh, microenvironmental systems. So specifically, I wanted to look at the range of stiffnesses that you would see within a clot and the range of thrombin concentrations that you might see in a clot. So thrombin is this activator. It causes platelets to um, go from round disks to these kind of spiky octopuses that are capable of you know, reaching and grabbing and pulling. Uh, and then and within a clot, we'll see a range of, of stiffnesses as the clot contracts. Now, what I found in looking at this was um, if you look at these different thrombin concentrations and different stiffness concentrations, some things are, are as we expect. As you increase the stiffness, you can see the amount of force that a platelet applies increases and uh, actually gets to a maximum. We, as the environment gets more and more and more stiff, it would seem that the platelet itself applies less force. And the other thing that happens is as you add more of this activator, thrombin, that you actually also get an increase in the amount of force that a platelet applies. And there's actually a maximum force that a platelet applies at this kind of moderate thrombin concentration and moderate stiffness. But what is nice about this particular system is that since we can measure the forces of a lot of platelets at once, we can um, begin to do studies to understand the signaling pathways involved. So just to give you a little bit of background on signaling pathways, they, they basically look like giant electrical circuits of <clears throat> uh, signal. Um, and in this particular case, I was using thrombin, fibrinogen, or fibrin. And uh, these are the receptors on the platelet surface, so integrant alpha 2b beta 3, PAR4 and PAR1. And at the very end of this uh, cascade of events, you see this clot retraction event. Now, the beauty of the contraction cytometer that was built is that we can actually start to understand, you can see that there's these two different kind of arms, this pathway, uh, that end in clot retraction. And if you look at, um, let's work backwards a little bit, you have actin myosin contraction. To get actin myosin contraction, you need myosin light chain to be phosphorylated. And so one of the arms of the circuit is myosin light chain kinase. That actually is an on switch. This is what phosphorylates myosin light chain. So that should enhance contraction. The other thing that happens is you have this myosin light chain phosphatase floating around, and that's actually more of an off switch. It's actually turning this myosin light chain off. You actually have this rho kinase, which is an off switch of the myosin light chain phosphatase. So this is an off switch of an off switch, so this can also enhance contractility. So the question is, which one of these two arms matter? And you can use inhibitors to rho kinase and myosin light chain kinase, which I've done here, and we can test the contraction forces. So in gray is a control. Orange is when I inhibit myosin light chain kinase. You can see that the difference between the control as we increase the stiffness of the substrate is pretty uh, marginal. However, when we inhibit rho kinase, there's a much lower amount of force that's applied by the individual platelets, and it also seems to uh, reduce the amount of force that the platelet applies as you increase the microenvironmental stiffness. Now, what's fascinating about this is that this was some of the first data showing that single platelet forces were reduced with rho kinase inhibition. But there was also literature that was already available that showed when you inhibit rho kinase that you get a reduction in the amount of clot contraction. So this is when you just take a big old clot like we showed you at the beginning, uh, you get a lot less contraction. And also the amount of clot, the bulk forces are lower as you might expect it. But what's also interesting is that in mice that don't have rho kinase two, they often have hematomas. We didn't really understand why did they have this bleeding and this was kind of uh, an interesting link that maybe suggests that contractile platelets, and especially highly contractile platelets, might be linked to bleeding and hemostasis in some way, shape, or form. So on that note, uh, Wilbur and I started to look at different patients that were coming into the clinic. Um, and we've done this with a lot of really amazing uh, clinical collaborators, including uh, Carolyn Bennett and uh, Sylvia Bunting. 
but uh, I'm going to point you to two different groups. So let me start here. So in patients that are healthy, this is the range of forces that you would expect to see. So between you know, 0 to 100 with an average force in the 40 nanonewtons. Uh, and then this group of patients uh, are individuals with an actin or myosin disorder. So we would expect these particular individuals to have low platelet forces, but it had never been measured before. And indeed, I can show you that, as expected, their platelet forces are low. Now, what's interesting is that there's also this group of patients that come into the hospital, they have bleeding, uh, and they have normal results for hemostasis. So that means that every standard test that we run uh, in the clinic on these individuals say that they're fine. However, they're bleeding, so they're clearly not fine. This test was the first one that showed a quantitative difference between these patients and healthy individuals. So in here, uh, you can see that not for all of them, but at least for some of them, these individuals had lower platelet forces than the healthy controls. The other interesting group that I'd like to focus on, uh, and I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, diving down into this next, is this patient is um, patients with something called immune thrombocytopenia. Um, so let me just actually jump ahead a little bit and go right into it. So uh, immune thrombocytopenia purpura, purpura is this uh, disorder that is um, related to very low platelet counts in patients. Um, you can see that uh, in extreme cases, the patients come in with these purpura and pratechiae. Uh, sometimes they'll have hemorrhaging. And it affects about 12,000 individuals in the U.S. a year. About a third of them are children. Uh, and bleeding is a significant risk. About 10% of these patients have major bleeding, and a half percent have life-threatening intracranial hemorrhage. But the challenge with this particular disorder, especially from a clinical perspective, is you diagnose it by excluding every other reason that someone has a low platelet count. Uh, and then the other challenge for clinicians is that many patients self-resolve, but a minority uh, become chronic. And they have this for, for life. So let's make sure. My... OK, so there's no existing diagnostic or biomarker that predicts who needs treatment or who will become chronic. There's no test. Uh, that really looks at platelet function. And all the treatments have side effects. Um, so steroids and IVIG, and in the most extreme case, they'll pull out your spleen uh, to try to correct this condition. So we looked at the contraction forces of these individuals. And what we found is that if you think about this histogram, oh, I've lost my mouse. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, I'm, okay. So we have this healthy control. You can see this is a histogram of forces where the majority of platelets have in this particular individual uh, between 40 and 80 nanonewtons, and you have this beautiful bell curve. In a lot of the ITP patients with no bleeding, we actually are seeing, um, so that's the light gray. Uh, you can actually see a bimodal distribution you can see a population of low contracting platelets, and you can see a population below 40 nanonewtons, and you can see a population of highly contractile platelets above 40 nanonewtons. And then pretty consistently, what we're finding is in patients with act or symptomatic bleeding, they only have a population of low contracting platelets. And that's what you can see in the purple. I apologize for not using the pointer. I'm having a, my poor laptop is uh, having a really hard time with this particular picture for some reason. Um, but hopefully you can see the bimodal distribution and the um, uh, low platelet forces in the bleeding patients. We've actually found that this has been fairly consistent. So there is a, a qualitative, or I guess I should say a semi-quantitative way of assigning bleeding uh, score, it's uh, scoring bleeding on a patient. And what you see is that all of the patients that have uh, higher bleeding scores, two through four, fall into this category of having uh, below uh, 25 nanonewton uh, single platelet force and low platelet count. Uh, and what's nice is that our particular uh, test, which is a biophysical biomarker, uh, we're seeing 100% sensitivity and 84% 84 84 specificity uh, with just average force, 
when we consider the platelet count as well, our specificity jumps to 95%. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing because right now there's no test that's able to assess the bleeding risk of these patients. And we have something that's 100% um, sensitive and 95% specific. Um, so that's a, that could be a big jump uh, for this particular group. Uh, the other thing that we're finding is that the patient's symptoms uh, tend to correlate uh, with platelet force and count. So in this particular patient, you can see that they started out bleeding. Uh, the red is the red square that I showed earlier, where this is kind of the, the risk zone. You can see that as the patient's platelet's uh, force went up or as the patient's uh, platelet count went up, they went from having a bleeding score in the two through four range to coming out and having um, no risk of bleeding. Now, this was a patient that started high force and went down to low force and started to display bleeding symptoms. This was a patient that started um, and had a pretty significant increase in the number of platelets, but not so much the average single platelet force. And uh, this was a patient that consistently had low platelet count, uh, but high force, and they had uh, minor to no bleeding symptoms. Now, what's been really exciting is that um, I've had a uh, I've been really lucky and I've had some absolutely amazing, um, uh, let's see, research technicians and gap year medical students that have worked with me on this um, and now graduate students. So they've, they've, they've acquired all of these titles and every time they go and they present this to hematologists, uh, they've won the more awards than I've ever seen given out. I'm, I'm so amazed with them. So this is Renee Copeland and uh, Alua Mayaku Noshinowo. Uh, and, and what happens uh, inevitably at the end of every one of their talks is they go, Oh, wow, that's cool. Why? Why does this happen? And and that's actually what, what uh, so Alua Mayakun or, or Mo, Mo and I are working on with Wilbur right now. We're really trying to understand what is the cause, what could possibly change the amount of force that uh, is applied by a platelet. And we have kind of two running theories. Uh, First, maybe the platelets themselves are defective. Uh, we know in, in immune thrombocytopenia that there's a lot of antibodies floating around. Uh, so maybe these antibodies are affecting how megakaryocytes, the precursor to platelets, make platelets and affect and making them uh, defective. Uh, we also know that uh, some of these antibodies might be able to pre-activate the platelets. So maybe they're just exhausted by the time we test them. Uh, or could perhaps the antibodies be directly interfering with the contractile function um, by binding to these integrins, the hands of the platelets. Um, and what else is exciting is that uh, impaired platelet forces appear to be Im implicated in many disorders. So I really focused on immune thrombocytopenia today. Uh, this was the idiopathic bleeding that I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, sickle cell disease, which can be a thrombotic disorder or lupus, which can have both symptoms of bleeding and thrombosis. Um, these all seem to be related to uh, lower platelet forces. And then also we've been doing this uh, really amazing project with Laura Downey looking at what happens in um, uh, neonates uh, that have undergone, und undergone cardiopulmonary bypass. And we see that there's a change in the amount of force that platelets have before and after surgery, and then again after transfusion. So there's a drop in force after surgery and then an increase in force after transfusion. So I only have a few minutes left, and what I thought I would close with is something that uh, is kind of a pet project, something that's really fun that we've been working on in some of our latest research. Um, so I showed you this, this slide earlier where you can see this, this large dramatic change in this clot size uh, and stiffness. And I mentioned to you that uh, it's all mediated by platelets uh, pulling at the single cell level. And, and the question is like, that's such a big difference, right? Like David, how in the world did you go from, you know, something that's collapsing 10 times and, and how in the world are just these little micro scale movements coordinating this? So we, we started to investigate this. And I, I have to say, I was just so lucky. We had this really amazing set of collaborators, uh, Yugi Sun and uh, Alex Alexi, even mechanical engineering. And uh, working with them has been phenomenal because they've asked me some of the hardest questions that I've received in my career uh, that have been really fun to answer. So I'll take the last few minutes to talk about this project. Uh, so the first thing we wanted to do is, you know, what do we know about bulk clot contraction? Well, the first thing is, is that when I 
kept throwing it in these square cubettes, I, I, I noticed over and over again that we got these really, really nice square clots at the end of it. And so, you know, I did what anybody did. I went down to Michael's Arts and Crafts, I bought a bunch of candy molds, and I threw clots inside and saw what happened. And here's a Lego person. You can see that the Lego person um, contracts and the, the shape of the clot is really maintained. Um, and so, you know, how, you know, what, what happens? And this is the results of all these candy molds. So you can see that we had a Lego person and um, between the initial and the final state, uh, the, the fidelity of clock contraction is pretty remarkable. This is a seashell and a sea star, puzzle piece, and even the letter A, and you can see the hole contracts as well. Um, so we got really interested in this process and we wanted to know how in the world does this happen? And uh, we did what all good engineers do. We started with a uh, analytical model. And the analytical model was we, we took a clot and we assumed that platelets have this influence area around them and that they can just contract down this influence area. And we said, okay, if platelets have this, uh, and, and, and the assumption here is that the platelets are all independent of one another in this model. And we said, how close does this analytical model get? And the unfortunate answer was not even close. There's a huge mismatch um, between the amount of uh, contraction that we measure experimentally and what this analytical model predicted. So this gave us our first clue that maybe platelets aren't acting independently, uh, that the, the dependent mechanical processes matter. And so we, we actually made uh, a virtual platelet, an in silico platelet. Uh, so you can see that here, uh, it's a, capable of, in a virtual system, we have this fiber and mesh and the platelet extends out these virtual philopodia and wraps it around itself. And what's interesting is this pretty much recapitulates what we see in scanning electron microscopy. Platelets in a contracted state are kind of wrapped in fibrin. We actually digitized this fibrin mesh of the clot, you can see here, uh, and populated it with platelets. Uh, and when you watch one of these things work, uh, this eye platelet pulling the fiber and mesh around it looks a lot like a real platelet uh, pulling a fiber and mesh around it. So uh, this was really exciting. Um, and one of the things that we also notice is that when we look at bulk clot contraction, we see that platelets will cluster, like you see here. And the other thing is you'll see these kind of lines forming. And this is where fibrin is orienting between the clusters. And so one of the questions is, is we have now this virtual in silico platelet and a virtual clot, and do we see these types of behaviors? And sure enough, we do. Uh, so between this initial and final clot state, you can see that the platelets are clustering, as you see in here, here, and you can also see this fibrin alignment, which is pretty similar to what we're seeing uh, in actual experiments. And and the the model certainly improved our predictions of final clock contraction size volume, but it, it still wasn't quite enough. And, and this is where we got our second clue that maybe there's a little bit more going on. You can see that the clot happens very quickly and after about 20 minutes, there's no change. And that's because in this particular case, we just set all of the platelets to contract and saw what happened. And that caused us to go back to the drawing board a little bit and say, whoa, wait a minute. Do all the platelets contract at once at the same time within a clot? Now what I'm showing here is uh, there is a marker that shows when a platelet is quote unquote done. Uh, so this is phosphatidylserine exposure. Uh, there's, there's a couple of different ways of, of looking at a platelet um, activation, but pretty much when we see this marker, yeah, the platelet's in an end stage. It's probably not contracting as much, or at least it's it's, Slowing down, and what you can see is that platelets express this end stage marker uh, at different times. You can see the amount of red that you see over time is glowing, and they're kind of popping up at different time points. And this is over 113 minutes, so this is a pretty long experiment. And that gave us a sense that maybe the platelet timing matters. And then we took a really close look at individual platelets, and I noticed that. Uh, individual philopodia are going out at different times and the platelets themselves are contracting at different times. Uh, so this was just three platelets that we happened to look at. So we took this information and we, we wrapped it back into our model. Um, and actually, let me, let me give you a little bit of the theory here. Why would timing matter? 
So if we look at these two platelets, A and B, they both contract. They reach out filopodia at the same time and contract. They can pull the fibrin fibers this distance apart. However, if one platelet pulls and then uh, the next platelet turns on and pulls and then can pull again, you can see that the fibrin fibers here are much closer than if there was um, uh, synchronous movements. Uh, and what we found was that even just a little bit of asynchronous behavior, so uh, in this case, 90% of the platelets contract all at once and 10% are left contracting at a later time point, that we get really great matches to the kinetics of clot contraction, so this dark green, uh, and also the final uh, clot volume here in white matches pretty closely with uh, this dark green. Uh, but, you know, this is really exciting. Um, but, you know, you can always get one concentration of platelets to work with one fiber and mesh. I mean, that's the danger of computational work. But what was amazing was when we changed the number of platelets that were in the clot uh, and didn't change any other parameters, that uh, in dark green, this asynchronous behavior matched pretty closely to what we see experimentally in black. So you see this pretty good agreement between the dark green asynchronous platelet contraction model and the black experimental data. Uh, we also got a little bit of really cool data on force, but I'm going to jump to the conclusion, so I leave a few time for questions. So uh, with that, I just wanted to kind of uh, wrap up this talk. Um, I showed you my journey from very traditional MEMS uh, into kind of microsystems for living systems and biology. Um, and, I, and I wanted to kind of let, um, uh, you know, the community know that I think there's still a lot of potential. And I think the key challenge is for, uh, this is a message for the engineers in the room, uh, that we need to go talk to the clinicians and work with them and figure out what are the really important problems that they care about and want to work on. Um, and that can be a really fruitful endeavor. Uh, I also wanted to just kind of highlight that my own work has shown that contractile force of all things may be a predictor of bleeding. So this biophysical biomarker um, may be important in health and disease. And it's part of this broader concept of mechanomedicine, the idea that mechanics plays a key role in medical outcomes. Uh, then we did this really cool uh, look at how platelets behave, and we found that uh, timing really matters. So we need to think about mechanobiology, not just in terms of 3D space, but in terms of time as well. Uh, and that this idea of asynchronous contraction can en enhance bulk clot contraction. Uh, so I have a lot of people to acknowledge. Uh, the first is um, all of the Alex and Yugi uh, at the top, uh, and all of the people in the complex fluids and modeling simulation group that we've been working with. Uh, Wilbur, of course, uh, has been an amazing mentor, uh, just a really phenomenal advocate, and um, I, you know, really lucky to have been able to work with him and, and continue to work with him. And then also uh, my lab. So I'm just starting a new lab at Emory. We've been here right about a year now, and the Sensors for Living Systems Lab, our focus is really on seeing what other sensors we can make and apply to the clinical space. So with that, I will close, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I'm sending virtual applause your way. Um, and we do have time for At least for not questions. virtual. Yeah. So um, if, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box, and I'll be happy to ask it. In the meantime, if we're, while we're waiting for people to ask any questions, um, I have a couple. And I'll, I'll go back. Um, one is kind of a technical one about the, the specific technique about the, using these micro dots and measuring their movement to, to get contractile force. And, and maybe you answered this and I missed it, but does the the way that you measure that force depend on how the micro dot itself adheres to the substrate? Yeah, that's a great question. I glossed right over that. Um, that, that's a really great question. So what happens is in this particular case, the microdot has to be covalently cross-linked to the gel below. Um, and if it was not, the platelet would actually be capable of ripping the protein right off of the gel. So we need a really firm adhesion. So, it's, so okay, so then I misunderstood. I thought, so it's not actually moving the Oh, the, micro, the protein, it's actually, sorry. it's it's moving the gel itself. It's moving the gel itself. Yeah, that was okay. a, I did a poor job explaining that. Thanks for asking okay. that. 
Okay. Um, we have another question from Todd Solchik. Uh, he says, great job with the engineering hat on. What is an exhausted platelet? Is there a way to regenerate? Oh, that's thanks, Todd. That's a good question. Um, so the idea is that uh, a platelet seems to have a limited lifespan uh, and once activated, um, the the amount of work, mechanical work that they can do is is almost on a on a it's it's almost like a battery. Uh, it it runs out. I actually don't know if uh, you can regenerate them. That is a phenomenal question. Um, my gut sense is that uh, at, with current techniques, no, but that would be a fun area to explore. Great. Um, let me ask one more question from my side, and that is um, on the the data you showed for the idiopathic bleeding patients. So the patients who came in bleeding but had no diagnostic that could tell tell people why, and yet you showed a decreased contractile force. Mm -hmm. So it, what is the physiological <laughs> explanation for that? Yeah, that, that's been the most, I can tell you that we don't know from a biological perspective. And the, the, the beautiful can of worms that we've opened is, is this correlation or is this causation? Um, and I think that one could make an argument that perhaps something else is going on and the side effect is that you get low platelet force, and this is, excuse me, something that we can measure. Uh, from the other perspective, uh, one might be able to imagine a situation where low platelet force uh, leads to clots that um, aren't mechanically very strong and are able to almost kind of rip apart very easily. As you can tell, I, I have to be very careful with my biases. Uh, and I might be leaning towards the latter. Um, but the trick is, is that we really need to, to answer this question of correlation versus causation. Um, and that's actually something that uh, Wilbur and I, and uh, we've been really lucky to get to work with these really amazing hematologists um, at UNC and UPenn. Um, we're trying to actually answer this question, what is the role of clot contraction itself in bleeding? And can we actually make a, a correlate, sorry, a causative link between contractile force and bleeding? But, but sorry, uh, just going back to your original question, uh, we don't know. Uh, and, and what we need to answer to figure that out is whether platelet force correlates or actually low platelet force causes bleeding. Okay, thank you. And I don't see any other further questions, so I think we'll um, we'll call a, a close to this seminar. Um, remember that we'll be meeting again on September 8th, two weeks from today, and tell your friends and, and neighbors and colleagues. And uh, and once again, thanks to David Myers for an excellent seminar. Appreciate it very much. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye. Sure.